All right, everyone, welcome. We're going to talk today about extensibility in DHS2. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Austin McGee. I'm the deputy tech lead for the DHS2 software team. And I'm apparently too loud because Max is turning me down. <laughs> um, that's the first time that's ever happened. Uh, <laughs> welcome, everybody. So today we're going to talk about extensibility, and I have a, a, a good group of, of folks to join me up here today to talk about uh, real-world experience with extending DHIS2. Um, but first, to get people kind of in the mood, um, who here has ever installed DHIS2 and never touched it again, and then it just worked for the rest, the rest of the time you used it? it, it it's out of the box, you install it, it's, it's, you never touch it again. Anybody raise hands. Who has done the opposite? Who has had to had to configure it, maybe had to extend it a little bit, had to change it? Raise your hands. Raise your hands on Zoom if you're if you're joining us there. I'm surprised. So so some people are are maybe maybe just working with empty DHS2 instances. That seems possible. Um, <laughs> maybe we need to work on some data use uh, in in those cases. Um, but what the the moral of the story is that. DHS2 always needs to be adapted to the local context. It almost always needs to be changed, needs to be extended, needs to be integrated with other systems that are around it to match the workflow and the use case for which it's being used. And so what we're going to talk about today is how we as a, as a community and we as the global software team can help to provide infrastructure and support for those extensions to make them easier lower cost, easier to maintain, uh, and, and uh, so on and so forth. But before I get started with that, I want to take us, wind us back to 2019, um, not for the obvious reason, but because that was the last DHS2 conference that was here, uh, live in Oslo. And back at that time, we had something, a, a vision called the application platform that we hadn't even started to, to, to roll out yet. Uh, and I gave a presentation uh, with this slide that is kind of dizzying, but it shows the cost of maintaining applications in DHIS2. This is particularly for the core team, which maintains 30 plus applications across multiple versions of DHIS2, many libraries that support that. And basically we're maintaining hundreds of code bases in order to keep DHIS2 running and provide all the features that you want across multiple versions. Uh, in, uh, in, in the wild. And that, that's only a piece of the puzzle because then there's also everyone else out there who are building additional applications in DHS2 to extend that functionality, to adapt to the local workflows, to the lo wor local data use uh, needs. Uh, those also in, in the world before the, the platform of DHS2 would need to have an entire set of uh, the components to build up an application. And so what we did by introducing the application platform, um, one piece of our extensibility infrastructure, I'll talk about some of the others later, is to do what's called inversion of control, where instead of allowing an application to basically take control of your entire web browser and do everything, which means that the developer that's building that application then needs to do everything for you, we flip that around so that DHS2 provides an encapsulated space that is a smaller problem space for the developer to work in, makes it easier to build something new, easier to iterate, and also easier to maintain those innovations over time. We also have built since 2019, and this was the slide that I presented at that point, um, have built an ecosystem around this application development uh, infrastructure. So not only do you build an application, but you deploy it, you test it locally, you deploy it to the App Hub, you share it with other uh, users of DHS2 who can then install it and use it and give you feedback. Uh, and that's the, the genesis for what we'll talk about uh, today. As I mentioned, the, there are multiple stages of what an application needs to do or an extension needs to do in DHS2. You need to build it. You need to maintain it over time, which is a lot harder than people anticipate. 
you might share it with other people. And that also comes with costs and also uh, challenges because you might be installed on a DHS2 instance that you've never seen before. You're, you, you maybe never will see because your, your application then needs to work in a, a completely different context. And then it needs to be used. And so then there's additional challenges around documentation and around use of uh, innovations and applications and extensions in the wild. So I wanted to share, I, I hope Dennis is here. Uh, he might be in the room somewhere. Um, but I wanted to share something that he said in the hallway to me the other day, um, which he was talking, I did not prompt him about this at all, I promise. Um, he was talking about what application development or extending of DHS2 looked like before the introduction of a lot of this infrastructure for extensibility in 2016. It involved forking DHS2 core, which in I think it was 225 that he was mentioning. That's when, when you fork DHS2, then you have to maintain that fork over time. And if new in, improvements come into the, the main branch of the core, you need to invest a lot of energy to bring that into the fork that you're maintaining. Apps were built in all sorts of different technologies. Each one was different. Each one was not related to other applications in the ecosystem. Uh, and just a very specific example, this we all know and, know and love the org unit tree in DHIS2. At that point, it was necessary to create your own from scratch and basically build up, how do, how do I represent all of these org units? How do I allow the user to select multiple of them? How do I allow them to select different levels? Uh, and, and none of that was provided easily out of the box at that time. So you needed to build that yourself if you were building a new application. And fast forward to today where things have become much faster and much easier uh, in Dennis's own words to, to extend DHS2. Um, and this is using the modern DHS2 application platform, the modern DHS2 core, so not a fork, building on top of the platform that we provide the extensibility infrastructure and using things like the UI library, which provide an out of the box way to represent org units and select org units at different levels and in different methods of selection. So I talked a little bit about this, uh, this platform, DHS2 as a platform. I'm a little bit hesitant to use the word platform because it is overused uh, incredibly in our uh, in our lexicon um, but that's that's the word that we're that we've been using for quite some time so what is this platform or what is this infrastructure for extensibility in DHIS2 and there's many many pieces of that the one that has been around the longest that is very powerful is the rest api so we have a as as most of you probably well know a very extensive and documented rest api that lets you do everything that the, an application in DHIS2 can do. Um, and there are some drawbacks to doing that from a UI perspective, uh, basically from a UI first um, design, but there are basically everything that you can do in DHIS2 in the web application happens through the API. And we provide that to everyone else to be able to build their integrations, build their extensions, build their applications on top of us. Uh, similarly, we have the app platform or the web app development framework, uh, which, as I mentioned, is uh, using inversion of control. We have the Android SDK to build mobile applications. We have a flexible data store, which, as uh, Lars mentioned yesterday, has been significantly enhanced and improved in the 238 release. We have UI design system. So this is written description of how you should design applications to be user friendly and accessible to varying various people that might be using DHIS2. And also importantly, gives people that are using DHIS2 a consistent system to interact with. So they can understand, I'm looking at a DHIS2 application, I see this org unit tree, I know what to do with that. Whereas if it was designed in a very different way, they would have to be trained or, or understand somehow that this is something that they've seen before in a different uh, form. So we have a design system. We also have libraries of components to be able to use that design system very easily in your applications and your extensions. We also have a, a number of other tools, including uh, a, a DHIS2 client written in Java more recently uh, by the interoperability team that is another form of how do you 
interact with DHS2 from outside of it and extend the, the capabilities of the core. We have standardized developer tools to be able to spin up local instances of DHS2 to test your application against multiple versions of DHS2, which has significantly improved the, the uh, agility of developers to build on top of, uh, on top of the core of the platform. We have an app hub, which allows you to uh, share your innovations, uh, everyone to share their innovations with other people in the community. And it allows those innovations to be reused and those investments also to be reused and uh, to become more efficient because they can apply to multiple different contexts. Uh, and that has been significantly improved in the last year or two as well. Um, we also have uh, extensive documentation, a community of developers and training for developers to build on top of the platform that is DHS2 and to build those types of extensions and applications. Uh, this is just a screenshot of the developer portal, which is the, the entry point for those developers to uh, get access to that community. And if you, if you aren't familiar with it, developers.dhs2.org, uh, there's a lot of material there. And we also run a lot of uh, trainings and do a lot of uh, direct outreach as well to the developer community. Uh, and hopefully those of you that are developers or that have developers on your team can, can join that community as well. So a lot of ha has happened since 2019 when, when the, the application platform idea was first uh, introduced at the, at the annual conference. Um, the, that platform was released and is now used by all of the, or nearly all of the applications that the core team develops in DHS2. It's also used by many, many dozens of uh, third party applications, both local applications, as well as ones that are shared and used across different, different countries, different regions. Um, the core apps have transitioned to using that app platform, which has reduced the cost of, of maintaining those applications over time for the core team and also allows us to bring new features and address bugs in a, in a faster way. Um, we've run developer academies and built a developer advocacy program, which allows us to reach out to that developer community to cultivate it, to allow that community to share with each other, as well as to provide support and importantly, get feedback from the developer community on how we can improve our tools and our infrastructure uh, in going forward. And one of the big ones that was mentioned a couple of times yesterday, but I don't think is maybe fully understood by everyone at this point yet, is that we decoupled releases of applications from the DHS2 core. So 238.0 has come out, uh, 238.1 should be coming out soon. Um, and that is the just the server side part of DHS2. And all of the applications can be installed and updated independently, which is a much smaller job, a much less risky operation than upgrading the entire DHS2 core. Uh, so that's something that we've worked hard to do. And it, it also allows us to reuse all of the tools that we're building for third-party developers to improve our own workflows and our own uh, processes. And that allows everyone else that's using DHS2 to, to get new features quicker, to upgrade individual applications when there's a bug, instead of needing to wait and do a ton of testing to upgrade their entire DHS2 core uh, and, and many other uh, advantages as well. So again, just to recap, what the platform infrastructure that we're developing uh, allows us to do is to make innovations cheaper to build, to maintain, to share, and to use. And I put cheaper here. I could also say easier. It's important to say cheaper also because this allows us to reduce the cost that it, it requires, the investment that's required to build a new innovation, to iterate on uh, top of DHS2. Uh, as well as to maintain it over time, which is uh, oftentimes an underappreciated cost of building these innovations and these applications, is that you, once you build it, you need to continue to maintain it, even if you're just using it within a single country, but especially if you're then sharing it with other countries or other uh, places that might want to use that, that innovation, that application. Uh, and finally, it's easier for users, cheaper for users to access and to use those applications, those innovations because of the common design framework, the common infrastructure. It's not, you're not 
needing to learn something new from scratch every time you see an application, you know you're in DHIS2, you know it's a DHIS2 application, you've seen these before, you know what an org use unit tree looks like, you can access that and and uh, and use it without needing to be fully retrained on, on a completely different interface that might change over time. And with that, I will turn it over now to uh, my colleague, I believe Prosper is coming next from HISP Uganda who will tell us about a, a collaboration for development of an application, several applications actually, um, in, between Uganda and Tanzania. Uh, and he'll be joined by Wilfred in just a moment. So thank you and please welcome Prosper who is getting his mic set up. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> thank you, Austin. Yeah. Uh. So we, we we're sharing um an example of the so many uh apps and uh, hacks and whatever have been happening over time. So um the example we are sharing is a uh, is one where we have collaborated uh, as uh, as Austin was sharing. It's very it's very expensive to maintain these apps with the different versions. So, our use case and our our sharing today is about uh, uh, how we've been able to collaborate and work on a, a common app that has worked over time. That has also even seen some uh, pieces of it being implemented in the core. So, I'm sharing this presentation with uh, uh, my colleague uh, Wilfred, and um, and 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 I will do the first bit. So, we. Oh, it's this one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, uh, this is one of the powerful tools that we have seen from the Alma scorecard that most of you have been using and struggling with. Uh, so in the early 2013, uh, with so many countries adopting DHIS2, um, it became so critical that we needed to continuously keep using it. But um, it wasn't giving enough information for a country level implementation. So a lot of countries uh, uh, were struggling to see how they can implement a scorecard. And of course, excited about the HIS2 implementation with the uh, sub-national data. So in Uganda, we, we started off in 2013 again with, with uh, some support from UNICEF. Uh, in trying to attempt the first um, DHIS2 apps, and uh, we developed a scorecard, a district scorecard for um, uh, MCH. Uh, and that was how it was looking a little bit very uh, similar to the Alma scorecard embedded into the DHIS2, and was exciting in terms of using the data. And this, and um, uh, our colleagues across the, the South, uh, the Tanzania, was also um, doing the same with the DHIS2 data uh, using the standard reports by then. Um, the, these were two initiative, initiatives which were all uh, moving, moving parallel at the same time, looking at the same platform and looking at the same data. Uh, and so um, uh, somehow uh, along the way, uh, John and, uh, and uh, John Lewis, uh, got us to work as an East African um, uh, community. And this uh, really pushed us to work now, start working together as his groups within the country. So this was Rwanda, all the way from Burundi, Rwanda, Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, and South Sudan to implement a regional ESC um, uh, data warehouse. And particularly the scorecard was part of it. So the joint effort, now the two apps and the reports uh, came together and we were able to build a scorecard uh, in the East African um, uh, data warehouse that was pulling data from all the East African states and then displaying it in the, on, the, on, the, on the website. Actually, that's a website where you find that scorecard. It's still running up to now. And, and and very exciting also to be able to see the comparison of the of the countries before we go to the alma uh, and this again was an effort between uh, now the, the the two teams the developers in uganda and the developers in uh, his south africa tanzania coming together and comparing notes and then we we, we started building that uh, which was very exciting and they really got us to start working together, moving from region or grow state to state, uh, setting them up, working together, con I mean, supporting all the other implementation we had in the country. Then um, 
as that was also happening, then uh, we got uh, support from uh, through the University of Oslo um, to uh, through from UNICEF that uh, helped us to be able to now consolidate all the efforts in the region and be able to build uh, three standard um, apps. Uh, which uh, which were generic, which were supposed to be generic, and then be able to use them across the East and Southern African region. And uh, and, and uh, Wilfred will share more about that. But what you will see in the pictures here is a team. Uh, apologies, this is not uh, looking so, it's looking a little bit hazy, but in the caption there is a team seated in Nairobi uh, working together on the scorecard from development uh, to testing and, uh, you know, planning. And the, the members there, not all of them are developers, but these are subject matter experts, people who, are, who have worked in the field. And we could see we had UNICEF um, uh, spearheading this process. Uh, it was a small group, uh, five the workshop. Then we have HISP Uganda. Then we have um, HISP Malawi. Uh, is up there. We have he had HISP Kenya uh, in there. We had HISP Tanzania, Ethiopia, and also HISP Uganda. Uh, so the, the team coming together and working together to plan on the development and also plan on the on the deployment. So this is a little bit of history on how we've been able to do this. And it's something that we feel that we can be able to, again, work with the, so many apps and the innovation that have come through uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, that we can be able to see how we can sustain, sustain this, because they're going to be very key for the future implementations, especially in disease surveillance, also in the immunization of registries, that we are, we, we are working on. So I'll turn it over to Wilfred to really share a little bit more about how we've been able to do this over time um, across this the region and, the, and, the, and, the, and the his groups. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, can you hear me? Great. Yeah, thanks, Prosper, uh, for the introduction. Um, as Prosper kind of uh, elaborated, this work started a little bit 2013, 2014, when we started all these, um, you know, um, work uh, along scorecard, development of scorecard internally. And then later on, we kind of formed this partnership in terms of uh, HIST Uganda, HIST Tanzania, but also um, Universe of also kind of coming in to kind of uh, uh, work with that. But also UNICEF played also a major role in terms of um, pushing this, um, we call data use apps. Um, looking back now, um, we see that we have gone a long way, more than five years now, which have passed. And through that five years, there's a lot of learning which we have gathered. One thing is um, recently we kind of understood that we really need to kind of understand which role of each organization should play in terms of uh, working together on this particular task. And um, one of the key things which we did is more kind of a map out. Uh, what are the roles of the HISP groups? You know, first of all. Uh, his groups play a key role in terms of gathering information, interpreting and document this information from the field. And the his groups have been doing that quite a good job in terms of understanding the implementation of scorecard, BNA, action tracker, documenting this and also playing, putting it together. Uh, the his uh, Tanzania and his Uganda now plays a key role in terms of coordinating these other his groups. Uh, collecting all these requirements and late, later on, of course, the team kind of develop these uh, requirements, test together with the team and, of course, support some of the configuration which is happening at the uh, in the individual countries. One of the key things also we have kind of learned throughout the process is more or less about documenting these uh, usability of these apps, kind of understanding how the user perception of these apps and also kind of understanding the better uh, aspect of the configuration. Um, together with that, we have also been working with the HISP global team here. Um, they have been playing a key role in terms of oversight of these uh, particular implementation of the app, especially on the uh, development aspect, quality aspect, and see that we kind of, you know, um, the development of the HISP groups are kind of also tying into the standards of the global thing, um, global teams. Uh, they have also been kind of playing um 
key role in terms of coordinating uh, coordination, the his groups, but also kind of uh, uh, putting together um, um, some of activities which we have been um, working on. Um, last but not least, uh, the UNICEF team has also been quite an instrumental. Uh, Maria, is she here? Oh, okay. Yes, uh, Maria has been kind of uh, instrumental in terms of uh, working together with the HISP groups, uh, coordinating the project, kind of, uh, you know, pushing together uh, some of the requirements which UNICEF have, but also some of the requirements which the country has. Um, we have been working with the UNICEF team in terms of making sure that we also follow up some of these, uh, um, you know, plans which we have uh, along the way. So UNICEF has been cut off, uh, quite instrumental in terms of uh, uh, supporting us, but also kind of be part of the process as well. And I think that has been kind of a key thing uh, during this particular uh, collaboration. So this is kind of uh, an example of a joint roadmap uh, and a release plan, which we kind of had. So much information right there. But uh, one thing which you kind of noticed that uh, we have kind of different layers of uh, uh, activities which we have. We have the implementation activities, uh, which the HISP groups are more or less kind of uh, supporting countries um, into, you know, implementing the scorecard, BNA and action tracker. Once all these uh, his groups implement, um, get the feedback, we sit together at least quarterly fashion and also kind of discuss these things. And along the way, the requirement kind of change. I remember back well, when we started 2016, we were only thinking about three apps, only scorecard, BNI and, uh, and action tracker, which is kind of linked uh, to the BNA. However, as we kind of continue to progress, we noticed that there are some organizations which are you know, doing the action tracking without doing the BNA. So there was a need to kind of say that we really need to, you know, develop a standalone action tracker where people could actually track some of the actions which they've agreed. And this kind of uh, evolved into uh, developing um, a third or at least another app, which is an action, standalone action tracker. So some of these um, uh, uh, plans which we have uh, kind of are divided into quarterly, uh, some of them divided into monthly, some of them divided at the, uh, weekly. We have these kind of bi-weekly meetings where we meet together, discuss a little bit of what is going on, plan together and also um, uh, coordinate some of the activities. Recently, we have also been trying to push out some of this information to the HISP groups, so other HISP groups so that they could understand what we are doing and also implement. Uh, for example, his West Africa have been showing a lot of interest in terms of implementing these uh, particular packages and we've been supporting them as well. But uh, recently we have uh, done a webinar, which support, of course, by the uh, his global team in terms of uh, creating the materials and also hosting this uh, webinar and share some of the information which you have so that not only the HISP East Africa could learn about it, but also, you know, uh, the larger group within uh, the HISP community could learn and also could continue with that. So this has been kind of a journey which we have been kind of uh, going through in terms of learning, uh, working together, uh, learning through that process and also sharing now our experiences and knowledge to the community so that they could also uh, understand and also take it forward uh, to uh, another places. Uh, then I will welcome Scott to continue with the presentation. Is it too high? No, it's good. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit now about how we can sustain some of these innovations. And as Austin was pointing out, we have a lot of tools to have innovation, but I don't think that we have collectively sorted out how do we actually keep these these innovations going long term and what does that look like what does that look like from you guys what does that look like from the core perspective and so that's what i'm going to go into a little bit first i want to talk about some rationale or motivations for why we would have an extensible ecosystem the first one is that essentially there's a lot of benefits um uh to having an extensible application and a lot of the applications, you're having to make a decision, should I do it in a generic way or should I do it in a custom way? And if I do it generically, what's my end goal, right? We have conducted, I think, about 15 interviews with nearly all of the groups represented in this room today, a lot of you personally. And what we have found out is that you are making apps 
not be generically, not necessarily because you want to share them with the world, or maybe you do, but that's not your primary concern. Your primary concern is that you have multiple DHIS2 Im implementations that you're managing that require the same functionality, the same application. So you make a generic app in your organization and use it in the various implementations of DHIS2 that you as an organization are supporting, right? And if it happens to be good for the rest of the world, great. I'll put it on the app hub. But once it's on the app hub, what happens? How do you sustain it, right? It's essentially most folks are just putting it out there and hoping that it somehow th lives on forever. And what we're seeing is that's probably not necessarily the case. There are many advantages for you all to make applications. First one is that you are able to move much more rapidly than the core. If you send me a JIRA ticket, who all has written a JIRA ticket that I've responded to? Yeah, a lot of people have, well, at least this side. This side's not so engaged. And it takes time, right? We are actually, so now, right now, we're on JIRA ticket like 15,000. But last week, we just submitted, we just completed JIRA ticket 87, <laughs> right? <laughs> 2016, all right, we're still working on it. It takes time to get stuff into core. We move slowly, we move incrementally, we test, it takes time. But with applications, you're able to move much more quickly. You're able to be responsive to specific requirements, to specific projects. You're able to be more agile. You have a closer connection to uh, the actual end users. Um, and you, and, and that's, a, that's a huge advantage. That's what we want. We want you to be able to do that. Um, you're also able to stretch DHIS2 beyond its current conf confines, right? You're able to go into new domains like education, agriculture, uh, climate change. And, and you're able to thrive in these new domains because you're able to extend DHIS2 with applications. These are good things, but there's also potentially some important questions or challenges that we have to address. How can um, adopters be assured of the quality of the application? So if you put the application on the app hub, how does anyone know it's a good app? Well, we've asked you and you told us you don't. In fact, you don't trust most of the applications that are on the app hub. You, you have no insight. They're basically a black box to you. You don't have enough information to know, should I adopt this application? So we actually see that adoption from the app hub is relatively limited, right? That's not what we want. We want people to be able to get apps from the App Hub, know the app is there, it's good quality, you can trust it, you can use it, and we want you to collaborate and share, right? Um, you don't know how the app is going to be sustained. So if I get an app from the App Hub that someone else made, how do I know it's gonna be there in six months? How do I know if I upgrade to a new version of DHIS2 that it will also be supported in that version? You don't know. And that's a, ser that's a serious limitation. And then, um, you know, once you have an app, you're not sure with how to deal with support. You're not sure how to deal with feature requests. You're not sure if, you know, my app gets adopted. If I, you know, if I'm His Uganda and my app gets adopted in, you know, Sri Lanka, for example, how do I deal with any of the feature requests coming from Sri Lanka? Are the people who paid for my app in Uganda going to pay for the Sri Lankans as well? You also are not able to build a roadmap. So you're not able to communicate, even if you do want to do something, this is what I'm going to do and galvanize support around it. And then funding, you know, at the end of the day, it comes back to funding and, and Austin made a few very salient points about things become cheaper. Um, if you start to use some of the resources and tools, the app platform, but these things do cost money. And we have asked, you know, done a lot of interviews and very few, if any, have what I think most people would consider a sustainable business model, business model, air quotes, right? We're not, in the, we're not a for-profit or anything here, um, but you don't have a, a predefined stream of revenue to be able to continuously develop, support your applications, right? So a few problems, let's talk about some ideas here. The first one is you've told us that you want to see when you look at the apps on the app hub, essentially what the plan is for that app. You wanna know who supports the application, both technically and financially. You want to know 
the, uh, the status of the app. So is it in progress? Is it actively being supported? Is it being only updated for new visions? Is it no longer supported at all? And you wanna know some financial information about that application. You wanna know, is it completely free? Some apps potentially charge for use, you know, under the DHIS2 license, that is a possibility. Some apps only charge for support. So if you want a functionality, you've got to pay me to help. You've got to pay me to build it. Uh, some are wrapped up in other bundled services. And this is, an, this is a frontier of DHIS2 app ecosystem that is we've basically not researched at all. What are the models? What are the ways for you to sustain your applications? Um, and this is something that we want to hear back from you. We want to know what you think are some reasonable ways that you are able to make apps, put them out in the ecosystem, have adopters, and be able to continuously sustain those applications. You know, we asked, we asked um, 15 app developers what they thought the, the best end goal for them would be. And we were told, you know, what's the ideal outcome for your application? And we were told 15 times that it would be brought into the core, that it become a core app, right? And that's possible for some, in some situations, as Prosper pointed out, we drag some of the functionalities from like scorecard into the core. But for the vast majority of applications, that's not possible, right? And what does that mean? That means essentially we're just making innovations, we're putting them out there, and they just, they just die, a slow death. And that's not benefiting anyone. So we've got to figure out not how do we drag everything into the core and University of Oslo owns everything, but how do you come up with models or how, and how does University of Oslo support those models to continuously sustain these applications? And this is, uh, and, and looking into kind of the financial thing um, uh, aspect of it is something that we have to, we have to figure out. Now, as Prosper and Wilfred um, made clear, I think, and certainly a, a lesson that we learned from COVID is that we have got to collaborate. We have got to foster collaborations and, and the collaborations means between app developers like his Tanzania, his Uganda. You know, every year we do this app competition. It'll come up on, on Thursday. And in that competition, we have probably five apps that are submitted to import data for DHIS2. You know, even within DHIS2, uh, you know, all of you sitting here, we're reinventing the wheel constantly, right? You all have shared problems. You're just working in isolation. You don't know that you have shared problems. And so we have to make some kind of means for you to share your issues and for to connect to those other DHIS2 um, providers, app developers, who are able to collaborate with you to, sh to, to work through these shared issues. Because you're not really doing it um, as it stands right now. Um, and, and this is, this is a, I think, a, a recipe for disaster. We need to make sure that you're able to connect, you're able to communicate with those who have shared issues, and you're able to build apps together. The more people working on applications and, and contributing to those applications, ultimately, the more sustainable they'll be. That's a double-sided, um, there's two sides to that coin. The other side is those who want to use the application. You need to be able to have a community, kind of a, a micro um, community of practice around the applications that you're using, right? So, you, you know, if Uganda is using the application and Sri Lanka is using the application, then they should be able to communicate. They should be able to say, hey, we're also using this application. Uh, we having these issues with the application. Um, can we collaborate and work together to improve the application? Or what are some of the best practices with the application? We have this community practice for DHIS2. And when we talk about DHIS2, we're talking about dozens of apps, but what we really need are small community practices just for each individual app that brings together the users of those apps um, across various geographies and domains so that they can collectively work together and share insights, potentially um, support one another in various revenue streams as they come up. Um, and then the, uh, the last one is we've been kind of toying with the idea and we've asked you guys, what would be some other good um, ways to kind of spark or jumpstart this, this uh, degree of collaboration? And so you've given us a couple of things. So the first one is it might be cool if UIO could foster um, 
um, application, like we could put out application challenges. So we have the app competition, but maybe we, we hear about shared problems and that we can put out a, a challenge to the community to get you know, a consortium of, of, of organizations, DHIS2 implementers, app developers together to address that problem. The other one is we can put out ideas, right? So we ask, we ask for an idea challenge and, and you tell us the, your, your shared problems and then we try to connect the dots because that's, I think, our role. Our role is to try to connect the dots. Our job is to make sure that you all are able to talk to each other. You're able to, to uh, collaborate. Uh, and we have to make sure that we're doing that around the app specifically. So I think with that, I will now hand it over to Pamud and he'll take us through Sri Lanka. Thanks very much. But uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, what I will do is I will uh, uh, explain to you the how we used uh, local innovation uh, through collaborations and country capacity building during the times of uh, COVID-19 pandemic in Sri Lanka. So apologies for those of you who are already familiar with the story, but I assure you uh, we are, what we are going to do today is to look at uh, it from a different perspective of uh, how we did the local innovations and capacity building and, and, and uh, how, uh, what we really, I mean, how we invested on the collaborations. Right, so uh, I will start with uh, this slide. I think you must be already familiar. This was uh, from Christine's presentation yesterday. So what you see here is uh, uh, an extract from a Norwegian newspaper. Uh, remember the date, it's uh, February 5th, 2020, right? So uh, this was in the early pandemic. And uh, in this uh, newspaper article, it was highlighting uh, how a product of uh, Norway is being used in uh, Sri Lanka for contact tracing and COVID surveillance. While in, uh, in Norway, they were basically using pen and paper. Right. So uh, this I heard was a big story in Norway. So let us see like uh, what really happened in Sri Lanka by then. So this is a timeline of uh, all the events that happened in Sri Lanka in the early pandemic. So we all know that uh, COVID-19 came into light uh, in uh, December uh, 2019. And Sri Lanka being a tourist destination, uh, we were very vulnerable because uh, I think uh, the second highest country we get tourists uh, from is China. So it was uh, uh, spreading rapidly in China. So the country was uh, really worried because we did not have a proper information system to do disease surveillance, a digital information system. We had a paper-based system, but uh, of course, like uh, we did not have a proper digital system, which was interconnected with all the stakeholders, not just uh, the health sector. So we had some discussions with the Ministry of Health back then, uh, that was around uh, January 20th, and we uh, had the first case of COVID-19 around uh, 26th or 27th January. But by the time we reported the first case, we were able to design a system uh, based on DHIS2 to do the port of entry screening. So how was this possible? This uh, again is a screenshot uh, from our DHIS2 Slack channel. So we, we are using, I mean, we as in the UIO and all the his groups are well connected. In addition to the using the community of practice, we are having this Slack. And what we usually do is like whenever we see something new happening in one of, uh, in any of the countries that we are supporting, we usually share it. So uh, again, the date is on 29th January. So uh, I shared what we did in Sri Lanka. So this was like ready to be piloted. In fact, like uh, everything was ready. And we, uh, I just mentioned here that we are planning to launch it tomorrow. And this again from uh, 31st January. Uh, this is a newspaper article from Sri Lanka where the, uh, uh, the Ministry of Health informs the parliament that uh, I must mention, they mention it as a group of doctors have produced an application uh, for digital surveillance. I will come back to why they mentioned a group of doctors, but it's quite interesting. Like, uh, so this, uh, whatever we did in Ministry of Health 
with with the team with the core team was rapidly spreading in 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 a in matter of few days uh, to norway as well as within the country right and this is what we have uh, what we had by uh, may 2020 so within a period of uh, four months we were able to design many modules so these modules were not produced overnight it was uh, kind of uh, produced uh, incrementally uh, based on the changing epidemiology of the disease and most of these components were customizations on dhs2 but i must mention there are few applications so custom developments local innovations on top of dhs2 so let's see what really happened and how uh, uh, we were able to produce these uh, local innovations. Right. So we all know, like when we are implementing DHS2, we, we usually customize the DHS2 platform. That, so that's what we initially did. We used the uh, DHS2, uh, the, the, the core platform, and we customized it. So we were able to produce nine modules uh, uh, in like uh, for six months of uh, COVID-19. They were both aggregate and individual uh, to collect aggregate and individual data. But the challenge was uh, that we were not able to meet some requirements at that time uh, using, uh, I mean, the core modules and customizing the DHIS2. So this was when we had to develop components on top of DHIS2, then number one. And the second thing is we had to integrate Right, so it was not just DHIS2, which was uh, which is the only system used in Sri Lanka. There are so many other systems, and uh, I mean people were very enthusiastic, so they were producing many solutions, and we had to integrate with them. So I I showed you like we were well connected with the UIO and the HISP network because I I have already informed them uh, back in late Jan January that we are doing these things. So when it came to development, we only had by that time just one developer. He was our lead developer in his Sri Lanka who has been there with us for so many years, but we could not actually reuse him to cater all these requirements. So this was when I informed uh, Ula, like we are kind of stuck. We have to uh, develop some components and uh, we only have this one fellow uh, and we need support. And I must also mention like his Sri Lanka and Ministry of Health were not alone in this uh, entire thing. We had very good support from the government of Sri Lanka. Uh, I'm in fact glad to see uh, the uh, the chief technology officer of, of our government ICT agency of Sri Lanka is uh, is present here in person, Mr. Hiranya. So what actually happened was the ICT agency of Sri Lanka uh, was working with us. So they said like, don't worry, we have people, we can arrange people, we can uh, get, get them together. It's just that you need to provide us guidance. So... Uh, we had UIO and the HISP network uh, from one side who was ready to help. And we had this local support from the uh, ICT agency. And we kind of uh, linked them together by organizing this hackathon. So it was a collaborative effort uh, uh, between HISP Sri Lanka and volunteer developers. So these were developers from uh, various uh, uh, private sector ICT companies uh, and, and volunteer developers, uh, I mean, who were doing freelancing. And we also had the Ministry of Health, the ICT agency, UIO, and our his network supporting us. So we were able to conduct this hackathon, hackathon mo uh, mostly virtually, but we had few people uh, gathering at the ICT uh, agency office. And, uh, uh, and I must also mention uh, Austin here, was the one who was kind of, I think uh, I, I troubled him or not. He had a couple of sleepless nights uh, trying to help uh, us online from, uh, you, were, you were based in France that time, right? Yes. Okay. Right. So with all this, we were able to design this COVID-19 surveillance package, which we, uh, which we were able to implement in Sri Lanka. And the other thing is like, we uh, often overlook uh, thinking like innovations are always tech solutions like web apps or Android apps. But what about training, right? So we were used to do trainings uh, physically on site. But during COVID-19, we had to revise our training approach. So we, were, we had to conduct trainings uh, online using platforms like Zoom. And in addition, we had these lengthy uh, training manuals. You all know what uh, a DHIS2 manual looks like at the moment, but it is, it, is, it is very lengthy for a reason. I mean, it is not supposed to be the end user manual that you should uh, try to introduce when you are doing training programs. But what we, what we actually did was to come up with this single page training, uh, training manuals, right? So uh, we were able to share it together with our training programs. And that again was an innovation. And uh, with all this, we were able to do, uh, I mean, um, have a local use. 
and the most important thing like all this while we were connected with the uio and the his network and they were working parallelly on a uh, on a kind of a metadata package so that all the countries can uh, use this innovation so it was something that was produced in sri lanka and few other countries so uio coordinated the entire effort and we were able to produce this uh, covid-19 uh, digital health tool toolkit right so this is like all the modules that we have around covid-19 surveillance in sri lanka but i must highlight the arrows that you see in yellow right uh, the ones here and there so these are all integrations so we had to integrate with laboratory systems and also uh, during the immunization campaign uh, I, i think those of you who joined the immunization uh, session yesterday uh, uh, i mean i, I presented uh, what we did like so we used this uh, digital public good divoc to produce our vaccination certificates and we had to create these integrations so this again was a lot of effort that uh, took place during the covid-19 pandemic right another example is our contact mapping visualization application so this was the one uh, i mean one of the very early applications that we built uh, i think it was in march 2020 uh, so our team and uh, the ict a team were working together to produce this application so this is a very basic one and what actually happened was uh, i mean once after the uh, produced this thing and this this again was posted on the community of practice and based on the interest uh, uio figured out that uh, it could be made more generic so we can share it uh, across the network and that's that was when with support of uh, austin and his team we were able to produce this generic uh, contact mapping visualization app, uh, app which is already there in the app hub right so this again was a collaboration this is not something his sri lanka did alone and uh, again another one to track uh, i mean in in early days of pandemic it was like we wanted to track people based on their mobile phone location like uh, which is a bit uh, unethical uh, looking back at it retrospectively but yeah like but the solution was ready it's not that uh, we are not saying like this was put into uh, full uh, use but uh, the solution we prepared because there was some requirement and then this was about icu bed tracking so we we often say that uh, uh, dhis2 is not a emr but during the pandemic what they wanted was not to see like i mean what's the diagnosis like what what has been the treatment course uh, of the patients in the critical care unit no they just wanted to know where the beds were available so we just uh, realized that dhis2 tracker capture application was a bit too much to be trained and used by icu staff so we created something very simple with this uh, you know like we do just have some few uh, bed icons which they have to tap on it and to uh, kind of change the colors to see whether a uh, bed is available or not right so all this was possible due to many reasons so one very local uh, contextual reason uh, how we were able to do this was our long term capacity building i will briefly mention what this is this again uh, actually it's a long term work so all this happened in 2009 a decade ago so the university of oslo and the norwegian government uh, had a collaboration with the university of colombo uh, to uh, to uh, create a masters program in health informatics to train doctors so uh, there were like i mean up to date more than 400 doctors have been trained on uh, digital health so if you ask why doctors that is again contextual because in sri lanka most of the uh, administration and uh, at national level and district level are medical doctors who are trained in uh, uh, specializations like administration public health and now we have informatics so th this is why the ministry of health when they were reporting to uh, the parliament group of doctors is because of this right so in fact uh, most of us, the senior implementers in our history lanka team are products of this uh, masters and then we have a md or a local doc uh, doctorate program and or Uh, uh actually they have completed the phd program from the university of oslo so what actually happens is university of oslo produce uh, the, the capacity right uh, so they do the phd program and once they complete it they go to go back to the global south for example in sri lanka we have two of them so they contribute back to conduct this uh, masters and doctoral program so these people were already there at national and uh, district level so it was very easy for us to communicate with them what to do because they were well familiar and uh, we were well connected and they not only train doc i mean uh, other doctors to do stuff they also train uh, the uh, the allied health staff including nurses public health midwives and other people the collaborations 
So it's all about collaborations. I must say this was the key most important thing. So what you are seeing here is uh, is one initial meeting we had in person, very few people at uh, ICT agency uh, back in March 2020, just before the hackathon. So we were actually planning for the hackathon. So we had collaborations within the country. We have never been able to engage so many different departments within the Ministry of Health before. But uh, during the pandemic, it was possible. I don't know why, and we are we are actually observing closely whether it will uh, routinize and it will continue to be so after the pandemic. And then the government ICT agency, as I mentioned before, they were really providing us the infrastructure. So we were using, I mean, uh, later, of course, uh, we had issues when it comes to COVID-19 uh, COVID immunization, where we registered the entire 20 mil 21 million population in DHIS2. So with that, we had... Uh, uh, some performance issues, uh, which I have yeah, presented yesterday. But the thing is, uh, uh, we were thankful that we were kind of hosting in the government cloud so they could provide us the resources. And they were really prioritizing and uh, they were never hesitant to provide us resources. So that's the infrastructure side. And they also provided uh, support uh, through their network. And uh, then again, uh, sharing of metadata and web applications. So uh, like it was not just Sri Lanka doing it. Uh, we had Sri Lanka, then later, uh, uh, I mean, we have already seen how uh, Uganda was contributing. So we had all, all these his groups contributing to create this metadata package and other innovations, which was shared across the network. And use of digital public goods. I think you will uh, get to hear more about uh, digital public goods on Thursday. So uh, DHIS2 is a digital public good, and we also use another digital public good, uh, DIVOC. This again is contextual because our government ICT agency was on the opinion that we should uh, invest more on digital public goods. But then again, it's not an easy task. So more innovations, more DPGs, you need a lot of capacity and uh, infrastructure uh, to sustain it. It's not, it's one thing is to uh, implement it, but sustaining it is the, uh, is the challenge. So in fact, this was kind of the support that we got uh, from the ICT agency. So this is a tweet uh, uh, Gautek LK is uh, ICT agencies, country ICT agencies, uh, uh, social media channel, and it was it is actually Hiranya who's uh, reached, I mean posting this. Uh, so uh, interesting thing to note here is like they are requesting some urgent help from a front end developer who has some uh, uh, tech expertise, and important thing is no prior expertise needed on DHIS two. Why? <laughs> it is because we had support. I mean, we only had one person in our team that time, but we had support from the University of Oslo core team and the HISP. And that is why we were not really keen on finding anyone uh, who has prior experience on DHS2, which is impossible to do in like a um, couple of days time. Right. Challenges and uh, how we approach them. So there were a lot of challenges. Now, uh, first thing is about engaging stakeholders. So the thing is like, it's not the infrastructure or the technology. I think we have so much of infrastructure and technology. It's always about the people, right? So without the people, you can't implement the innovations. You can have innovations, you can develop innovations, but they will not be put into practice. So, so that is why it's always about engaging with stakeholders. So these stakeholders, I mean, I mean, these are about soft skills of your organization and uh, even uh, the stakeholders that you are dealing with. Because like, if a country feels, if the ministry feels that you produce something that will be put into good use and you will be there to help, you are not just there to introduce a solution, just pilot it and get uh, the research data and disappear. Then the next time you go there and try to implement, they will not support, right? So it's, uh, I mean... These are not computers. People have their own memories, right? So, uh, and trust. So the thing is like, uh, the more you uh, uh, create trust uh, with, I mean, in, in minds of people, it is very easy uh, for you to collaborate. The local capacity and skills is a challenge. So we have, we still have that challenge because the thing is like, uh, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are a small team, but it's just that we are managing with the help of uh, everyone else. But the issue is the more capacity and skills that you try to retain, you need more resources, right? You can't just uh, keep developers idling in your team. It's uh, costly. It's again, a, a very valuable human resource. So this uh, can be a major challenge. And the financial support for development and integration. So we all love 
apps. We like innovations. We like uh, nice things. But the thing is, we don't tend to realize that integrations really cost. So when it comes to solutions, there are people who are there to maintain and fund the platforms. But the connection between the platform is a really costly thing that you have to kind of continue for the entire lifetime and the people don't really tend to realize, right? So this is one challenge because uh, you will have some initial funding to support the integration, but in the lo uh, long term, uh, this becomes a major challenge. And again, something to do, with, to do that with is the sustainability of innovation. So this again, I think um, uh, the previous presenters already mentioned, like you can uh, kind of innovate something for your country, but when uh, so many other people start uh, using it, you don't have the resources to assign from your team to cater all the requirements. So this again can be very challenging. And finally, networking in the community. So I think I have heard uh, discussing with few of you, the main challenge uh, that we had in most of the countries was that during the pandemic, TAs couldn't, fly, uh, couldn't fly into the country, right? So if the country did not have a proper capacity and if they are not part of a network, they were isolated and it was not possible. But for us, uh, I mean, for his Sri Lanka, we, we had very good support from the UIO and all uh, this awesome uh, his network. And I'm really thankful to them. So we have many of them, the logos that you are seeing now. So it's all together 17, his uh, group. So thank you very much for your support uh, during the pandemic. Yeah, so I think. All right, everyone. can you hear me? All right. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully, hopefully you can hear me on the on Zoom as well. Yeah. Good. Great. Thank you very much to my fellow presenters here. Um, I think it's inspiring and interesting to to hear the stories of collaboration and working together to solve problems, especially in, in a huge time crunch as it was uh, in March 2020. Um, I do remember some of those sleepless nights. I remember the the, the weekend specifically uh, when we were working together. Um, and it's it was very early also in uh, the working from home, uh, everybody everybody connecting remotely world that we were living in. We, we had been uh, a remote organization for some time, but it wasn't something that everyone was familiar with. So there was a lot of radio silence and, and it's, what's going on? <laughs> Do you need me? Is it, it should, should I wake up at 3 a.m. Or, or should I not wake up at 3 a.m.? <laughs> um, I didn't that time, I think, um, because they didn't need me for everything. <laughs> but it was really uh, inspiring to be a part of, uh, of that with Sri Lanka and also with, with the, the, the larger community. Um, and just before I get, I switch back over to the other presentation. Um, what what Pamud was was mentioning about the innovations that Sri Lanka uh, spearheaded in in this COVID uh, pandemic work. Um, it, so much of that has fed back into the global uh, DHS two and and all of the different regions around the world that use DHS two. So there's the obvious one of the metadata package for COVID nineteen. Uh, there's uh, a lot of innovation in uh, or, or, or challenges that were run into with the relationship model in DHS2 Tracker that are now being uh, improved in DHS2 Core as well. Uh, and there's uh, from from the the genesis of that hackathon uh, in March 2020 is is a lot of the developer advocacy and developer community work that that we've done since that time has has come from that in that we we recognized the uh, the importance of uh, the support to developers who might not have any knowledge of DHS2 whatsoever but our, our good developers know the problem that they need to solve much better than than the global team ever could uh, and that's something that we have uh, it, uh, really grasped and 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 moved forward since then all three of those developer academies have been since after that March 2020. Um, uh, um, uh, hackathon uh, with Sri Lanka. So the developer academies that have each had 30 to 40 people from around the world learning how to build uh, applications on DHS2 
uh, were all after that time. Um, I think it was actually March 2020, though, I, I will correct myself, was after the first uh, Android Developer Academy, which was also in Sri Lanka, I believe, in December 2019. Yeah. <laughs> okay, moving over back to this slide. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, extensibility in DHS2 again. Uh, and the key, the key takeaway that I want to, uh, to share is that it's not just apps. Very, very rarely, uh, sometimes, but rarely is it just an application that stands on. We have infrastructure for applications in DHS2. We have infrastructure for Android applications and web applications. But very often, there's a lot of other things that need to be put in place to really make those work for uh, the extension of DHS2 in a, in a robust way. Uh, and some of that is, is the soft skills. Some of that is the training, the capacity building around those applications. But there's so much technical work that also often needs to happen around those applications. Um, and I have some examples of that, um, some from the, the Sri Lanka example, but many others from around the world um, and, and that I will share. Uh, but almost all of those, basically, you need you need something else beyond just an application. You can you can build a new interface for what DHS2 can currently do, but so often you need to integrate with an external system, or you need to put something onto the dashboard in addition to having an application, or you need an an Android app that needs to have some way to configure it uh, in in a generic way. And sometimes you need a custom data model or a custom database or metadata packages. And the interaction between the application and the metadata package is quite complex. So you need to kind of bundle those together. Uh, and that makes it costly and uh, challenging to uh, develop, but also to extend or use those innovations in DHS2. Losing battery on my mic, so I will be right back. <laughs> It's okay. Is that good? Good. Okay. So you should be able to hear me with battery now. Great. Um, yeah. So I'm going to talk about a, a few specific examples of those innovations. What what's required outside of just an application? Uh, how extensibility extends beyond just apps? Uh, in a moment. Uh, and also how uh, much of that is not tech not technically supported by the scaffolding of the DHS2 platform today. Uh, it's something that we have good support for applications, but everything else you kind of need to figure out for yourself and put together and then uh, teach other people how to do it if you want the, to share that innovation with others as well. Uh, and that's something we'd like to change. So the first example is the, the relationship mapping example from, from, from Sri Lanka. Uh, and this is uh, was an application that really pushed the boundaries of what you could do with the relationship model in DHS2 Tracker. Um, it also pushed the boundaries of what you could do uh, in, in a browser when, when COVID started going crazy and this, this graph started getting really big and you tried to download it all and put it in your browser. That was a challenge. So there were performance issues that we ran into uh, from the API itself, but also in, in the browser and being able to uh, support that and, and provide tooling to let people uh, more easily uh, adapt to larger databases uh, was something that um, was an early lesson from this development of this application, but also came from the uh, introducing 21 million uh, tracked entity instances into, into DHS2 as a whole. Uh, so not only the uh, extensibility and the, and the application of relationship mapping. Um, so the relationship data model itself, um, as I mentioned, is something that was a challenge with this application that uh, is beyond the scope of what the application itself could do. So it couldn't solve those problems by itself. And so that's something that we needed to, to provide and to uh, integrate into the DHS2 core and the platform itself to make that possible for other applications as well. Another big example is uh, COVID vaccine certificates. So you heard mention of DIVOC in Sri Lanka, but there is also uh, several other efforts to build COVID vaccine certificate systems. 
uh, as integrations between DHS2 and some external system, whether that's custom built or it's based on the, the EU specification or it's DIVOC, which is a global public good. Uh, Oftentimes, that is a combination of not only an application, uh, in, in this case, it's often a customization of an existing core application, which is a, is a whole nother thing, right? So you don't want to tell all of your, uh, your people that are delivering vaccines who are currently using tracker capture or the capture application to learn an entirely new app just to, to issue the vaccine certificate. You want it to be part of their workflow in uh, the um, uh, in, in tracker capture itself or in capture application, but it's not something that is easily extens extensible there. So you then going back again to the forking example, you then need to fork at least the application for data entry. Maybe you need to fork all of DHIS2 uh, as well. Um, but then even once you've done that and you've added the, the, the user interface to be able to uh, issue and maybe print a vaccine certificate in a, in a clinic or in a facility, uh, that's not enough because then you need to somehow integrate that new interface that you've built with some external system that actually does the issuing of the certificates. And maybe also that, that system needs to do the, the verification of those certificates. So that is something that has been a challenge uh, that has come up across many different use cases, particularly for COVID vaccine certificates, because you, you can't just, uh, or, or it's, it's a challenge to then just talk to some external system uh, because you need to think about authentication. You need to make sure that if you're doing this in a, in a sensitive uh, environment like COVID vaccine certificates, you don't want it to just be open to the public internet. So you need to have some sort of authentication. You need to integrate with the authentication system of DHIS2. And that's something that isn't easy to do out of the box and something that we want to improve as well. Um, and then there's another, another whole component of this with the, the public access side of, of COVID that we all know very well. So there oftentimes is the public dashboard for viewing the statistics of DHIS2. I'll talk about public, public dashboards in a minute. But then there's also, uh, in the case of COVID vaccine certificates, you need some mechanism of verifying those certificates and you need to control the access of who can verify those certificates maybe. And you need to protect the information that is contained in those certificates so it isn't just open to the public as well. And that's another challenge that is outside of the realm of an application, but is an extension to DHIS2 that you need to support uh, in, in the extensibility infrastructure. That is very similar, uh, or, or maybe one specific case of interoperability. And we see this over and over with um, applications that are built that integrate with some external system through the browser. Uh, because that's we, the, the system makes it so easy to build an application and to build a new interface that you can, you can build that, you can download all the data from DHIS2, and then you can push it to some external system, or you can pull it from some external system and push it to DHIS2. There are security challenges with that because you need to then authenticate with this external system from the browser. And how do you do that? How do you deal with different users in DHIS2? How do you share the credentials for this external system with multiple users without actually telling them what the password is? Those types of things. How do you also deal with performance when you uh, are starting to talk about 21 million tracked entity instances or uh, even just large volumes or large uh, um, uh, large amounts of data coming from an external system into DHIS2, downloading all of that into some, some user's browser that might be a Chromebook uh, is, is a big challenge and something that uh, you support that we have for applications. Uh, and it also prevents you from having the, uh, the user interface that an application can let you build so easily. Um, so that's why so often it, the, the easier path is to build it in, in the browser without dealing with some of those more uh, challenging performance and security complexities. Another one that I mentioned a minute ago was, is public portals. So COVID vaccine certificates um, is one thing, but COVID public portals is access to analytics data from the public. And uh, there are a lot of challenges, security obviously in accessing uh, that data from, from uh, a public website. Um, there's performance challenges as well, because if you do it the naive way where you just plug in the public portal to DHIS2 core API, uh, and then every time anyone in, in your country or in the world goes to your public portal, 
you will uh, crash your server very quickly. Um, so you need to really think about security and performance when you're doing these things. Uh, and again, this is extending DHIS2 with public access to analytics, but it's not an application. So it's beyond the, 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 the concept of an app as the, the, the core piece of extensibility in DHIS2. There's also a lot of complexity in setting up a, a public portal uh, that could be could be made a lot easier, but every every single public portal, every type of public portal, every single one that is set up in a country, is is done separately. It, the the wheel is reinvented, uh, and some you have to think about all of those security and performance challenges over and over again, rather than having a, a kind of out of the box and and standardized way to to address those challenges. And then there's another one, which is mobile apps. Um, so this is, we have apps, but then we also have um, apps on the web. We also have apps on mobile. And uh, the Android SDK uh, supports the, the Android data capture application. Um, it also supports many third-party applications. You'll see some of them in the, in the app competition on Thursday. Um, but even that core application requires something beyond just that one app. So it maybe requires a web application as well to be able to configure the Android settings app, to be able to configure globally the applications that are connecting to DHIS2. And you need to store that configuration somewhere. So it also requires the data store and it requires uh, some, some custom data model that maybe needs to change over time as you release new versions of the application. Uh, so it's not just that app uh, again. Uh, and there's so much uh, additional challenges with not only uh, mobile apps, um, which have uh, performance uh, challenges as well, that the Android team works very hard to, uh, to, to uh, mitigate. But if you have 10,000 people that are all of a sudden using mobile apps and hitting your DHS2 server at the same time, that's a whole nother paradigm that you need to think about in terms of performance. And that's something that we could uh, could address beyond the, the scope of what we currently uh, support with uh, extensibility infrastructure in uh, mobile applications. So one way to address this is to move towards what I, what I call full stack extensions, but it's just expanding the concept of applications as the, the thing that you do to extend DHIS2 to be extensions as a whole. So that in, it includes interoperability. It includes server-side con, uh, configuration, data model extensions, API extensions, server-side logic sitting somewhere. Um, and there are so many reasons that we need this. Uh, one is because uh, we're reinventing the wheel. As I've just mentioned so many times, each of those had many examples of what had been, when, when that, that problem had been solved. Uh, but in a different way every single time with a lot of effort spent to address those challenges or not enough effort spent to address those challenges, which, which left them with security or performance issues um, or sustainability issues. Um, it also significantly improves the ability of these extensions to be shared amongst different use cases. So uh, the App Hub let, makes it very easy. And there are challenges, obviously, with sustainability and with understanding the sustainability model of those applications, but it makes it very easy to, to put the application somewhere where other people can use it. Uh, it also improves setup and maintenance of those applications, both or extensions, both in the uh, when once they're installed or set up in a particular DHS2 instance but also over time for the developer of that applic application or extension. Uh, and as I mentioned in, in, in the previous slides, performance, security, reusability, and interoperability are all uh, things that would be significantly improved by moving to this model. Um, I'm not gonna go into the technical details too much. So I have uh, each of these kind of broken down uh, a bit more on the, on the following slides. But there's a lot that we can do to, to continue to support this concept of extensibility infrastructure in DHS2 uh, as a, uh, an extension, no pun intended, from applications uh, as the, 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 the core um, model there. So the first is guides, documentation, training. And this is a, uh, the logical kind of uh, progression of the developer advocacy program that we have and continuing that and continuing to uh, document best practices or, or good practices, not necessarily best practices, but good practices for setting up a public portal, for example, for doing interoperability through an application 
why those are challenging, why the the easiest path is maybe not the best path in some of those cases, documenting those the those learnings uh, and giving guidance on how how to approach those problems when you see them so that you're not reinventing the wheel and not uh, running into those challenges afresh every time you you do that. Um, and then there's collaboration. Um, oops, sorry. I have a meeting in five minutes. <laughs> uh, um, so I will wrap up. Uh, uh, the collaboration is a huge, a huge part of this as well. So we we heard um, from, uh, or, or we will hear from the UIO Design Lab, and there are other university innovation labs that we're working with. Um, but also in and amongst the the DHIS two community in that ecosystem. Um, I'm not sure why this didn't. Oh, it is connecting. <laughs> Apologies, one second. Maybe my internet. Oh, Zoom disconnected. <laughs> one moment. And I was just wrapping up, too. It was building to the climax. <laughs> I, I can go ahead and just talk so long as my, my, my audio is still going. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so I don't need the rest of the slides, but basically the concept is uh, applications are not the, the extent of extensibility. Extensibility is so much more than that. Uh, and we can build a lot of infrastructure, both uh, soft skill, interpersonal training, uh, capacity building, community building around development of these extensions, but also technical infrastructure around how we can uh, make it easier to build uh, extensions that have server-side components that integrate with external systems and have a, a, a complex uh, topology of all of these different pieces of extensibility, uh, how those all need to work together to be able to be shared, to be able to be built, maintained, shared, and used uh, cost-effectively and, and easier than they are today. Um, so with that, I think we'll wrap up for the day <laughs> because my internet isn't working and we don't have any slides. Thank you. <laughs> now wrap up for the day. Sorry. Everybody can go home now. You came in from 8.30 to 10. <laughs> uh, I think 30 minutes and we have the, the breakout sessions across the, across the hall. <laughs>